Good evening. It is great to be with you this evening. Uh, my name is Brent Rosendahl, and I'm originally from Canada, and I have been serving as a missionary in Thailand for 20 years. Uh, serving alongside me is my wife, Thom, who is originally from Thailand and is a great asset to the ministry there. We have one son who is named Owen and is 15 years old and going into the 10th grade. And I'm here by myself for two months. My family is back in Thailand because my son had to start school this week as well. And so that is why they are not here with me. Thailand is located in Southeast Asia. It is a country of 72 million people and it is about three quarters the size of the state of Texas. Thailand is 95% Buddhist, 4% Muslim, and the first Christian missionaries came to Thailand about 200 years ago, and yet Christianity has only grown to be about half a percent of Thailand's population. To be Thai is to be Buddhist, and Buddhism plays a very important part in every aspect of Thai society. God has called our family to start churches in Thailand, and so we began Antioch Baptist Church in Chiang Mai, Thailand, a city of about 1 million people, 17 or 18 years ago. On our very first Sunday, we had one Thai person in our very first service. Today, we average about 50 in our Sunday morning worship services, and earlier this year, we set an attendance record for a non-special event Sunday when we had 66 people in our Sunday morning worship service. And so we're grateful for what God is doing in Thailand. Our goal is to raise up Thai men to become pastor, to be able to take over the work and then move on to a new location and begin the process all over again. But God has had a different plan for our ministry than what we had originally planned. Because over the past 17 or 18 years, we haven't been able to raise up a Thai man to become pastor at Antioch Baptist Church. But in that time, we have been able to raise up four missionaries that Antioch has sent out to other parts of Thailand and into Myanmar as well. Two of our missionaries serve part-time in Myanmar and in Thailand. Many people in the West do not know that Myanmar right now is in the midst of a civil war. And the location where they are currently ministering is a place that I am unable to go. I have tried to go where they're ministering, but as a white Westerner, they do not allow me into that part of Myanmar because it is too dangerous. And so when our missionaries will go there, they'll go to different vill villages doing evangelism and trying to reach people in new villages. When they return to Thailand and then go back to Myanmar again to revisit the villages that they went on the previous visit, sometimes those villages are no longer there because they've been bombed and people have had to flee for their lives. And so we're grateful that God is using Thai people to bring the gospel to areas of Myanmar that we as Westerners are unable to go. Another one of our missionaries was able to start Cornerstone Baptist Church in a village there in Thailand. And that work has been passed off to a local pastor. Antioch was able to provide all the funds necessary to be able to build the church building in the village where uh, that church is as well. All of the missionaries that Antioch has sent out are completely funded by churches in Thailand and do not receive any funds from outside of Thailand. And so we're grateful for that. We have also started Thailand Missionary Baptist Institute at Antioch Baptist Church uh, to train Thai people to be pastors and missionaries. This past semester, we had 23 people in our Bible Institute, and we're excited for all the students that are in our Bible Institute. We only have two problems. First, of the 23 students that we have in our Bible Institute, none of them feel called to preach or to be missionaries. They're just average church members who are filling in for me while I am gone, but do not feel called to the ministry. And so we're praying that God would raise up a man to be able to take over the work there in Chiang Mai and raise up other men to be pastors and missionaries as well. Our other problem is, is our seminary only has one professor, and that's me. I get to teach every single subject in our Bible Institute. And so a four-year degree, because we're now filming them, uh, will take about 16 years to accomplish. Not because the students are slow, but because the professor is slow in preparing all the classes that are necessary for a four-year degree. But we're excited for students that are studying right at Antioch. We have students, because we're doing it online now, studying in other regions of Thailand as well. And so we are grateful for that. As I travel around the U.S., I'm visiting churches, asking churches to come alongside us in two ways. First, we're asking churches to consider praying for us and the ministry that we are doing in Thailand. Pray that God would send revival to Thailand, something that has never happened in the history of that nation. 
Pray, too, that God would raise up men to be pastors and missionaries, and that we would have more strong Christian leaders in Thailand. Our second need is financially, financial. I am grateful for churches like this because right now our monthly support is uh, where it needs to be, due in part to the support of this church, and so we're grateful for that. But right now we are trying to raise money in order to purchase land. A minute ago I said that we had 66 people in a service earlier this year. Right now our auditorium can seat 70 people, and so we're getting very close to capacity at the location that we are now. And so we're looking to purchase land to be able to build a church building that Antioch can call home. Uh, In my opinion, land in Thailand is very expensive. We are looking to purchase about half an acre of land, and it will cost us between 160 and 200,000 US dollars. Many people here think half an acre of land, how can you build a church building on half an acre of land? Well, in Thailand, it's cheaper to build up than it is to build out. And so half an acre of land is plenty of space to build a church that would be able to seat about 150 people there as well. Our issue right now is that we have raised about 50% of that. We've got about 100,000. Antioch has saved about 70,000. I've been able to raise about 25,000. But our issue is, is because churches are not recognized in Thailand, we cannot get a loan to purchase land. We have to pay in cash. And so we cannot purchase any land until we have all the cash in hand. And that's why I say the cost of land is about 160 to 200,000, because it will all depend on the day we have cash in hand, how much the piece of land that we are able to purchase will actually cost. And so that is what God is doing. And we're asking churches to consider making a one-time donation or multiple donations to help us raise the rest of that money that we need to be able to purchase land. I have a booth out back. I talked to many of you already tonight, but if anyone else has anything that you would like to talk to me about, I would be pleased and happy to talk to you about Thailand. But before that, does anybody have any questions about Thailand and ministry that we're doing there? Yes. Am I what? I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, praise God. Yes. How much money do y'all need to be able to purchase We need to have about 160 to 200,000 US, and we are close to about 100,000 right now. So, depending on what the land will cost on that day, we're around 50% or a little higher. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Myanmar, yes. It is not a religious war, it is ethnic cleansing. And so the Burmese are trying to get rid of pretty much every other nationality and people group that is in Myanmar at this time. Yes. No, we have freedom of religion in Thailand, and so we're free to do whatever we want. Uh, The only difficulty is is that churches aren't recognized there, and so we cannot get a loan, and uh, that is our major issue. But we're free to do whatever. Yes? Uh Uh-huh. I'm sorry, I missed the end because of the cough. Uh, again, land, no. Once we have the land, we can get a loan to build the building. It's just the land that uh, we cannot get a loan for. We would be able to get a loan if we put it in the name of a Thai person, but that's not a really good idea to put it in the name of one individual. And so we have a foundation that we've started there, and so the foundation, the land will be in the name of the foundation, but foundations cannot get a loan for land. Yes? Yes, and so especially when we began our church, that was our main form of outreach to people. Now, because I'm so busy doing other things, our English teaching has kind of not become as prevalent as it used to be. Uh, But Brother Rusty Tier, who was here, I think about a year ago, you've said, uh, his main ministry is teaching English, and so he goes into various schools and teaches English there. 
In reality, English is very popular, but there's a language that they want to learn even more than English now, and that is Chinese, because there's more Chinese tourists that come to Thailand than there is Western tourists. And so if you can speak Thai, English, and Chinese, your ability to get a good paying job is pretty high. And so that's why they want to speak all three languages. So, yes. They have many regional languages. Thai is the language that unites the country. Uh, I don't remember how many years ago, let's say 100 years ago, Thailand used to be four kingdoms that came together to form Thailand. And so each region has their own dialect. And if you saw in the video, sometimes you may have noticed that I was working through a translator. As I'm speaking, I'm still preaching in Thai. Uh, but it's being translated into the dialect of the people there because especially the older people do not understand Thai. Uh, most of the younger people will all, will all understand Thai today. Yes? It depends on where you live. Up north where I live, the two main things are farming, especially rice and corn. But corn is not corn that they uh, raise to eat. It's uh, produced for biodiesel. And then tourism is a very big industry up north where I live. Uh, it's Bangkok is the center of many businesses, and so there's a lot of uh, different corporations that are in Bangkok and central Thailand. And then in the south, it is rubber and tourism as well because of all the beaches that are in the southern part of Thailand. Well, I'd like to be able to have time to share God's word with you tonight as well. So if you have any other questions, you can come talk to me at my booth. Uh, remember to get a prayer card and sign up your name to be able to receive our monthly newsletter as well. So if you have your Bibles with you tonight, I would ask you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, we're going to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture, but as we examine this passage, I hope that ministry in Thailand will help us to have maybe a different point of view as we look at this familiar passage Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. And God's word says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the blessing that this church is to our ministry in Thailand. We ask God that you would bless this church and the ministry that she does here in Tulsa and the lives of all the members here as well. As we examine your word tonight, we ask God that you would uh, convict our hearts that you would challenge us, and that you would bring about heart change. You would help us to be more and more obedient to your word. I pray that you would lead me as I preach. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight I'd like to look at the mission work of Jesus. I understand that Jesus was 100% God, but Jesus was also 100% man. And in the fact that Jesus was man, I believe that Jesus set forth a great example to us in how to do mission work. And so I'd like us to consider that tonight. First, I'd like us to see that Jesus ministered to people's needs. Look back to verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. We see that Jesus didn't have a come and see mentality. Jesus wasn't stationary in one location, hoping for people coming to see him in that place. We see that Jesus ventured from city to city, village to village, and ministered to people no matter where he was. This is kind of contradictory to the idea of many modern churches today, because many people today think if we have just the right kind of facility, with just the right kind of programs, with just the right kind of music, and just the right kind of preacher will begin to attract a big crowd. That may have been true 50, 60, 70 years ago, but I think most of us would admit that it's not a very good method of doing ministry anymore today. And we see that Jesus didn't use that method. 
we see that Jesus went out ministering to people where people were located. And so God calls us to leave the walls of this church building to do ministry outside these walls as well. And as we look at Jesus' ministry, we see that his ministry was twofold. We see that Jesus majored in ministering to people's spiritual needs. Notice that it says here that he preached the gospel of the kingdom. So no matter where he went, where he ministered to people, we see the central aspect of his ministry was spiritual. That he was preaching the truth of the gospel of the kingdom, calling people to repent and put their faith and trust in him. No matter what ministry we do as a church or as a ministry, gospel must be front and center in every ministry that we do. However, we see that Jesus didn't stop at just meeting people's spiritual needs. We see, too, that he also ministered to people's physical needs. It says here that he healed every sickness and every disease among the people. I know that we no longer have the gift of healing today. However, people are still hurting. People have different needs in their lives. And so we need to be able to come alongside people in areas where they're hurting, ministering to their physical needs while sharing the gospel with them as well. The Bible tells us that we are supposed to take care of the orphans and the widows, the sojourners, the people that are coming from foreign countries to our nation. It is our duty as believers to be able to minister to these people where they are, both physically and spiritually. When we have a twofold ministry, I believe that our ministry becomes much more impactful because the old adage is true. People don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. And some people may be struggling so much in their day-to-day -day life that they're not open to the truth of the gospel. But once their physical and their personal needs have been met in some way, it opens their heart to the truth of the gospel as well. We also see that Jesus had compassion for, people, for the people's needs. Look verse, back to verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And so we see that when Jesus went from location to location, oftentimes there would be a large group of people that would gather to hear him speak. As I prepared thinking about this sermon, I focused on this word multitude. And I don't know if you're like me, when you hear the word multitude, you think that it's just a big group of people. But we forget to think about all the individuals that comprise that multitude. If you're like me, sometimes we think that the multitudes that came to hear Jesus were all the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I believe that they were there. But as we look at Jesus' ministry, we see that there was all kinds of people that came to Jesus. There's tax collectors. There was people that had all kinds of infirmities. We see that there was adulterers and people caught in sin. These are the people that comprised the multitudes. And as Jesus looked upon these multitudes, what happened in Jesus' heart? It says right there, he was moved with compassion. I'm sad to say that when I see the multitudes of people that don't know Christ, Oftentimes, the thing that happens in my heart is not compassion. I think many of us, when we see the multitudes, those that don't know Christ, the thing that occurs in our hearts is apathy, complacency. We don't really care because we're so focused on our day-to-day -day lives and the things that we need to accomplish. It's even more sad that many Christians today may have an even more negative view of the multitudes, especially considering that the multitudes may be comprised of people of different political persuasions, people comprised of lifestyles that we cannot agree with, people of different religions. And when bad things happen to those people, the thing that happens in our heart sometimes is they deserved it. It's good for them because of the choices they made. But when we look at Jesus, that's not how Jesus responded. Jesus responded with compassion, no matter who those people were. And we see that the compassion came because Jesus saw that they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. This word fainted as used here is a word that has changed meaning over the history of the English language. 
When I hear the word fainted, I think of me going to the doctor's office and them drawing blood and beginning to pass out fainting. And I think that's probably what most of us think of when we hear the word faint. But the word faint that's used here means to be utterly helpless. And so Jesus looked upon these multitudes of people comprised of people of all kinds of backgrounds. And he had compassion on them. Why? Because he saw that they were utterly helpless. Without him, they were dying and going to hell. Without him, they would never have the abundant life that God has promised to us. They were like sheep without a shepherd. They were lost. They had no one to protect them, no one to guide them, no one to help them. Jesus knew that he was the answer. Jesus knew that he could help. And that caused him to have compassion for the people he met, no matter where he journeyed. And I believe that that's what God is calling us as Christians to do as well. To have compassion on people that are different than us. Compassion on people that have different worldviews than us because they're helpless, dying and going to hell without him. That was the mission work of Jesus. I also like us to consider the harvest, the results from mission work. I like us to see two things. First, that Jesus understood the condition of the harvest. Verse 37 says, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Jesus said that as he looked upon these multitudes, he saw a great harvest. The harvest is truly plenteous. I know that we are a Bible-believing Baptist, and we would attest that this Bible verse is true. But I'm not sure if all of us believe it's true here in our hearts. When I listen to many Christians today, I hear many people say, oh, the world is just so hard-hearted. People are not interested in spiritual things. There's just no interest in things of God. And the way we talk makes it seem like the harvest is limited, that the harvest is scarce, that there's not many people. But that is totally opposite of what Jesus said. Because Jesus said that the harvest is truly plenteous. That means that there's many, many people in our midst, in our community, in this nation, that are wanting to know the truth of the gospel and are just waiting for somebody to come and share and love on them. One missionary said that in our world today of about 8 billion people, one in three people claim to be a Christian. One in three people have heard the gospel and rejected it. One in three people have never had the opportunity to hear the gospel message. That means in a world of about 8 billion people, there's about 2.5 to 3 billion people that have never had the opportunity to hear the gospel message. And when we think of the magnitude of the task that God has given to us, many of us think, I'm just one person. How could I ever make an impact on 2.5 billion people? Or we may think we're just one church. How could we ever make a difference? And when we think about the magnitude of the task and see how great it is, oftentimes we become overwhelmed. And I don't know how you respond when you're overwhelmed. But when I'm overwhelmed, I tend to do nothing. And many of us are doing nothing to make an impact on the task that God has given to each and every one of us. Another reason that we're overwhelmed is that we live in a nation that is just full of so many different viewpoints and worldviews. And we're just not sure how to start with people that are just so different than us. And so I want to share a little bit about ministry in Thailand. Thailand is a lot different than America because Thailand is 95% Buddhist. Most people have a fairly similar worldview, the way they see the world around them. But in my opinion, Buddhism is probably the religion that is the most diametrically opposed to Christianity. And so I would like us to look at one verse tonight and show just how revolutionary this verse is to a Buddhist mindset. It's a verse that probably most of us know by heart. Most of us have memorized. And that is John 3.16. And so I want to look at this revolutionary verse tonight. So let's look at John 3.16. John 3.16 begins by saying, For God. We've run into our first problem in Thailand when we use John 
when ministering to an unbeliever. Their question is, what God are you talking about? Buddhism in its nature is atheistic. They do not believe in any kind of creator being or anything that is supreme over all of creation. But you wouldn't know that living in Thailand because Thais have a great fear of spirits. Almost every Thai house has a little spirit house that is in front of their house that they bring food to and drink every morning, hoping to attract good spirits to protect the household that lives on that piece of land. And so when you say God, their first question is, is what God are you talking about? Which spirit are you talking about? We have another problem because in Thailand, the word that we use to address the king of Thailand is the same word that we use to speak of God. And so it brought, raises problems again what, when you say God. What are you talking about? Let's say a Thai person admits, okay, I believe that there's a supreme being that created everything. We still have a problem. Because Buddhism teaches that this world is full of pain and suffering. And if God created this world, that God must not be a very good God. Because this world is full of pain and suffering. Let's look back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world, we've run into another problem. The word with this phrase. A minute ago I told you that Buddhists believe that this world is full of pain and suffering. The way to alleviate pain and suffering is to remove all desire from your life. And so in Thailand, people that enter the monkhood to be a Buddhist monk will often abandon their wife, their children, all their earthly possessions to move into the monkhood because they're trying to get rid of every desire in their life. What's the ultimate desire? Love. And here's this God that loves us. Which means that this God is still stuck in the same cycle of pain and suffering because he still has desire. Let's look back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We've run into a third problem. This word gave refers to Jesus' death on the cross. And so for a Thai person listening to the gospel message and you talk about how Jesus suffered and died on a cross, their original thought is, Jesus must have been a really bad person. He died on that cross, paying for karma from a previous life. And as a result of all the bad things he did in his previous lives, he's now facing the consequences of those decisions. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is a blessed truth to us as believers. Amen. Repenting, putting your trust and faith in Jesus Christ results in everlasting life. We've run into our fourth problem with the Buddhist mindset. Because Buddhists believe they already have everlasting life. And they're trying to get out of everlasting life. They believe that they've been reincarnated over and over and over again. And they want this cycle of reincarnation to end by reaching nirvana. Nirvana refers to nothingness, ceasing to exist, the end of everlasting life. You ever thought how revolutionary John 3.16 is to some of the people that you may be ministering to? And sometimes as I live in Thailand, I'm just a shy Canadian speaking in a foreign nation, in a foreign language to people that are completely different to me. And sometimes it's overwhelming. And I think, God, why me? And I remember, I'm just a normal guy that God has called to this ministry. And in the same way God has called me halfway across the world, God is calling you as well. If we look back in Matthew chapter 9, it says that the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. If you let me speak bluntly, many Christians today think the problem's out there. But when I look at this verse, the problem's in here. It says that the harvest is truly plenteous. There's people waiting to respond to the truth of the gospel. What's the issue? That the laborers 
are few. I still believe that God is in the business of calling people to the ministry. The problem is, is many people are not responding to God's call. But I don't want you to feel like you're off the hook. Because the word laborer here is not referring just to pastors and missionaries alone. If you call yourself a child of God, you are now a laborer. And it is now your task to go into the harvest and minister to people's spiritual and physical needs. The final thing we see is that Jesus understood the solution to the harvest. Verse 38 says, Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Notice that it is his harvest. God is not scared or shocked by the condition of the harvest. He knows the hearts of people. The question is, is are you going to go and minister in the harvest? One thing that we can do, according to this verse, is that we can pray. Pray that God would send laborers into his harvest. But I want to warn you that praying that God send laborers into his harvest may be the most dangerous and risky prayer you ever pray. You may pray, God, send somebody to reach my neighbor, my loved one, my co-worker. They need the gospel. One day as you're praying, God knocks on your heart and says, I am. I'm calling you. And the question is, is are you going to go with the compassion in your heart to minister to the needs of those people? The harvest truly is plenteous. Don't misunderstand. The Bible doesn't say the harvest is easy. In Canada, where I'm from, there's a lot of farmers. I'm not a farmer at all. But I know that harvest season is busy season. It's a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of time. And unfortunately, many of us today think that if we go out into the harvest and we preach the gospel one time, boop, this person will come to Christ. Boop, this person comes to Christ. But that's not the way it works. Oftentimes, it's a process that may take months. In Thailand, it often takes years. The question is, will you be faithful in the labor that God has called you to or not? When you look at the multitudes that don't know Christ, does your heart respond with compassion? If not, pray that God would give you the compassion that he has for the dying and lost that are around you. Give you the courage to begin to minister, especially to their spiritual needs, but to their physical needs as well. And I believe that as you as an individual and you as a church begin to respond to God's call, God will do far more than you ever thought possible. Because God is an awesome God.